You know how TV chefs have their catchphrase like, Bazinga! <laughs> Thank you to Animal Logic for sponsoring this video. If you love learning about cool animals or just appreciating the beauty of the world, you'll love Animal Logic. Subscribe now for free on YouTube. Reusable bags, because cool kids stand the environment. Ew. That was my roommate. Anyway, let's talk about fish. From sushi to casseroles to tacos, fish appear in just about any diet and in just about any form. But here's the thing. There is about a 30% chance that this isn't what you think it is. So what is it? Before we get into the nitty gritty of species and DNA testing, I thought it would be worthwhile to look into what makes a fish a fish. Which is a trickier question than you might expect because there's no such thing as a fish. So in high school, you might remember having to learn taxonomy, which is this hierarchical labeling system. There's domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and me falling asleep in biology class. But that isn't the only way to classify creatures. There's also a thing called cladistics. Derived from the works of Willy Hennig, cladistics groups organisms by common characteristics traced all the way back to their common ancestor. This grouping is called a clade. It makes sense if you think about it, because instead of grouping things by how much they look like each other, you group them by how closely they're related. But that isn't to say that cladistics is better than taxonomy. Like, imagine you had a chicken pot pie. Taxonomy will group it in with all of the other pies, from meat to fruit. Cladistics will recognize that a lot of its ingredients are similar to those you'd find in dinner dishes. So depending on what you need and what you're looking for, whether it's dinner or pie, you'll use a different perspective. But cladistics has this really fun feature or flaw where if you try and create a clade of certain things like fish, no matter which way you slice it and build that ancestral tree, you always end up picking something distinctly non-fish, like a frog or a bird or a human being. So you kind of just need to accept that every vertebrae is a fish, or there's no such thing as a fish. Which is stupid, because you know what a fish is. It looks a little like this, pardon me living my Disney Channel dream, it lives in the water and it tastes good with a bit of lemon. You don't need to go back a million years to know if a fish is a fish. So what's the point of all these labels? To find the answer, I asked Dr. Virginia Schutte. She has a PhD in ecology and is also the nicest person I've ever met. So a lot of biological science is about finding patterns in the world. If we can predict when something will happen and know when it might not, then we understand the world pretty well. And that's really hard to do if you don't know which species you're working with. So for example, imagine you have a bunch of fish and you wanna know how they're responding to water pollution. One fish responds one way and another fish doesn't. Without labeling the fish, we don't know if this is just how 50% of all fish respond or if it's because this is a red fish and this one is blue. So labels are important, but what if they're lying? So fish fraud is when someone calls a fish that is one thing by another name. This is different from mislabeling a fish. Fraud is the intent to deceive and mislabeling can be accidental. Other than that, they are the exact same thing. Your fish is not what your fish actually is. Now it is important to distinguish the two because the intent changes the cause, which changes the cure. Fish fraud is caused in two ways. One, someone catches a cheap fish and sells it as a more expensive fish to make more money. Or two, someone accidentally catches a protected fish but doesn't want to go through the effort of returning it to the water. On the other hand, fish mislabeling is often the byproduct of this really long and absurd seafood supply chain where a fish can cross a bunch of hands, borders, and languages. So for example, a butterfish in Canada is a different scientifically named species than a butterfish in the United States, which may or may not be the same as a butterfish in Hawaii, which is also a part of the United States. So it's really difficult to keep all the fish names completely clear, even when you're in the same country. And this problem occurs a lot more often than you might expect. A review of 51 peer-reviewed papers testing over 4,500 samples worldwide estimates that about 30% of fish species are mislabeled. Now the actual likelihood that the fish you're about to eat is a fraud depends on where you are, what you're eating, and how long it took to get to your plate. So the key is to know where your fish is coming from and how it was caught. All right, so here's my secret. I don't buy good fish. You see, I'm a college kid, so I have this really awful mix of 
an empty wallet and a really poor taste palate. So when I want fish, I'm going to the grocery store and digging out those discounted frozen fillets at the bottom of the freezer. And I know that that isn't good for me, but I always figured that it was just a colder version of the same fish at the counter where you need to talk to people to get food, which is my nightmare. But now there's just this 30% chance that I'm wrong and that's sort of weird. So how do you avoid that? How do you spot fish fraud? If it still has a head, the chances of misidentifying the fish is pretty low. Everything from mouth, eyes, and fins can make identifying a fish pretty easy. But this is literally a rectangle of meat, so what else can you do? You might be able to piece a guess together by the shape, color, bones, and myotomes, which are the little meat squiggles you see on the fish. But honestly, even if you are able to tell this and this apart, a lot of the key details can be obscured with a single slice. Three, DNA testing. It works basically the same way it does for humans and crime scenes. You take the fish's DNA and match it against a known reference. There is actually this massive database called the Barcode of Life that has a reference library that can be used to identify the unknown. And finally, number four, a taste test, which is totally unscientific, but uh, I just bought a new apron and I wanted to show it off on camera. Ka-chow. Anyway, I have got three fish fillets in front of me. I've got a frozen cod, a fresh cod, and a fresh tilapia, because tilapia is a common imposter for cod. So I am close to 100% certain that the fresh fish are not imposters. I got them from a place that fillets their own fish, making mislabeling highly unlikely. So the idea is, if we cook these three fillets the exact same way, if the frozen cod tastes like the fresh one, they should be the same fish. But if it tastes like the tilapia, then we've got a problem. And if all three of them taste the exact same, then we've got a bigger problem, because it would make this entire segment kind of pointless. Anyway, let's look up some easy cod recipes. Let's do baked. Not because the even heating would allow for a more scientifically valid finding, but I'm really bad at cooking stuff on a stove. Everything is always burnt. It literally starts with, I have a confession to make, my friends. Well, geez, I wish I had some ingredients. Ooh, ingredients! <laughs> I need to mince these two things. Um, I think mincing just means cutting really small. Oh god, it's just not cutting. I'm just rubbing the knife against the leaves. I say that looks kind of minced. I'll, I'll let you see too, here. Does that look minced to you? I'm just gonna push that aside. Is that one clove? You know what, in case there's vampires, I'm gonna go two cloves, just in case, you know? I'm so worried that somebody who actually cooks is gonna comment on this video and they're like, please never hold a knife again, Sabrina. You are going to hurt yourself. Anyway, so I need to mix everything that I prepared together in a bowl, but I don't have any more bowls. So I'm gonna do it in this little gauntlet mug thing. That looks awful. Can you see that? I guess it's gonna taste good. I'm gonna cook them in this skillet over here. Why not use a baking sheet? Because it's over here as a background prop. So these are the tilapia, these are the frozen cod, and this is the fresh cod. I only seasoned one side of the fish. That's cooking, right? I love cooking channels. They're like one of the only things that I watch on the internet. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna make this so beautiful. Then I chose the grossest looking recipe on earth. So now this thing needs to go in the oven. So this thing needs to be washed before this thing goes in the oven. Bye. Remember when Robert Durst confessed to murder when he had a hot mic on? Well, he's not the only one. Now uh, let's get this bad boy to the oven. Done. Ooh, dang, dog. It looks like somebody vomited on them. But I think that all that's left to do is try it. So let's do tilapia first. I mean, I definitely put too much whatever the green thing was, because it just tastes like that. But I have to say, in my expert opinion, it tastes like fish. Let's see if there's a difference. We're going for the fresh cod now. Oh, so texturally, the fresh cod is like radically different from the tilapia. It's, it's more flaky than stringy, but this isn't the cooking channel, so you don't care about those things. And finally, let's go with the frozen cod. Well, that's just not good. <laughs> So where one is kind of stringy, one is kind of flaky, the frozen cod tastes like cardboard stacked on top of each other. I'm gonna try a bigger piece because that one might have just been overcooked. Oh, that's weird. The frozen cod feels a lot like the tilapia. What? Uh-oh. Do we have a controversy? So, experiment results. Inconclusive. What? So, I mean, I could get all clickbait and be like, ha, gotcha, frozen fish companies. You were lying. But 
I don't really know for sure. The only thing that I'm really going off of is mouthfeel. And the frozen cod and the fresh tilapia kind of had the same mouthfeel. Now I don't know if that's because they're the same fish, or I just overcooked both of them. So I know that labels are really important for science, but I'm not a scientist. I just want to eat dinner, and even with these three fish in front of me, I can't really tell the difference. So what's the problem? Well, there are three reasons. One, economics. If someone is committing fish fraud, they're inflating the supply of the fish that they're faking. This can drive down prices and hurt honest fisheries. Two, health. People have allergies and dietary restrictions that make it really important to know what they're actually eating. And three, environmental. Not only can an inflated supply make the public think that fish are less endangered than they really are, if we don't try and crack down on fish fraud, there is no incentive for dishonest fisheries to stop harvesting endangered and protected species. It's also important to know how that fish was caught and where. So for example, sustainable seafood guides may tell you that Atlantic cod is not a good idea if it's been fished with a bottom trawl. That's a net that drags along the bottom of the seafloor. As it drags, it destroys everything living on the bottom. Corals, sea fans, plants, not a good thing. But if you buy Atlantic cod that have been grown in an indoor tank, those are rated as sustainable fisheries. So fish fraud is kind of just a byproduct of this bigger problem. A lack of transparency in the seafood supply chain. Seafood changes hands so many times that it's like this game of broken telephone where the truth gets broken and bent with each step. And I know how easy it is to get disheartened with problems like this that feel so big and institutional and impossible to solve. But the solution exists and it's surprisingly small. If you're looking for seafood, try and find places that pride themselves in knowing where they got their fish. Create the incentive for dishonest fisheries to get honest, even if it means having to talk to someone at the grocery store to ask if their seafood is sustainably caught, which seems terrifying and kind of extra. But it's the only way things are gonna change. So, I'm gonna do it, or at least I'm gonna try. Will you? Hey there, I hope you liked that video. It would mean a lot if you stuck around to hear me thank a few of the people who made it possible, starting with Dr. Virginia Schutte. She was super patient explaining all of the fish to me, and this video would not have been possible without her. And second, Danielle Dufo from Animal Logic. Awesomely enough, she is another educational YouTuber in Toronto, which is where I am from. She actually works as a scientific illustrator at the Royal Ontario Museum, which is like a block away from my school. We shot a whole outro for this video together, but in true Toronto fashion, it turned out like this. My hair is not cooperating with the wind right now. How do you look like stunning? <laughs> so much sirens. Anyway, since you can't hear her explaining what animal logic is all about, I will! In each episode, Danielle combines her gorgeous scientific illustrations with these awesome explanations of Earth's coolest creatures. If you like the whole explainer thing I do on my channel, you will love Animal Logic. If you want to check them out, which you should, you should start off with their video on the amazing birds of Costa Rica. I'll leave a link to it somewhere. If you love them like I do, you should hit subscribe and tell them I sent you. But either way, have a lovely day.